All right. Um, I'm here with Ward Churchill today. Ward is a writer, academic, and activist who taught as a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder for 17 years. He has published numerous works on the systemic issues facing Indigenous populations and has examined the far-reaching consequences of genocide in America. Today, we are going to be discussing the FBI's COINTELPRO, which targeted a wide spectrum of radical and progressive movements and operated from 1956 until 1971. In 1990, Ward, alongside Jim Vanderwall, published documents that were turned up by the Church Commission and through Freedom of Information Act requests. These documents outline a comprehensive attempt by the Bureau, led by J. Edgar Hoover, to quell efforts for social change in the United States. We are going to talk about the execution and implications of one of the most aggressive and comprehensive attempts by the state to maintain status quo configurations of power. So I want to thank Ward for taking the time to speak with me over Zoom, and I'm looking forward to exploring an obscure but important chapter in the history of the United States. So thank you so much for coming on today. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Great. Um, so I'll just get right into the questions. The first one being just sort of an intro to someone who doesn't understand what COINTELPRO is. How would you describe it to them? Well, first of all, it's a cryptonym. I mean, COINTELPRO can be translated into actual language. It stands for counterintelligence program, which is a misnomer because counterintelligence is aimed at intelligence agencies countering the work of intelligence agencies of hostile foreign powers. That's within the charter or mandate of the FBI. COINTELPRO um, was actually counter subversive from the perspective of the right wingers who were in charge of the FBI. I think you can do the bios of every significant FBI official back to day one, and you're not going to find a liberally inclined individual anywhere in the mix. So these guys are right wingers defining subversion through that lens. So you're looking at the left broadly posited, the labor movement, black dissidents, anarchists, communists, socialists, unruly women, what becomes known as feminism, so on, and so on. Okay. And they're to be kept in their place, which in a lot of instances, essentially meant non-existence. That was the objective. And that's been the case since day one. The FBI's had operational focus in that regard since before it was the FBI, back in the days when it was the Bureau of Investigation. This is formalized in 1956. What they basically did, according to the FBI official uh, assistant director, Bill Sullivan at the time, who ran it, he was the guy in charge, um, section, section five, division five of the FBI, which was internal security. Uh, they drew these techniques together and the relationship to counterintelligence is that they were utilizing techniques applied to espionage agents, saboteurs and so forth, non-US citizens operating <laughs> for, as I said, usually hostile foreign powers, but foreign powers nonetheless. And the rules are a little different with non-citizens who are engaged in illegal activities to the detriment of the United States. Uh, the constitutional rules don't apply entirely. You can use techniques against them that are not permissible legally. Right. Okay? In the popular understanding, not permissible when used against U.S. citizens, good Americans and all. What they were doing was secretly applying these techniques for political reasons, not because they necessarily believed that there was any hostile foreign power or any foreign power at all involved with the organizations that were being targeted, the individuals that were being targeted, but basically it was just to render a counterbalance in a democratic society to right-wing preferences or corporate preferences, ultimately in the end, plutocrats, 
um, anything to counterbalance their wishes. So you end up with a, a very unbalanced system. You also end up with what in objective analysis usually applied to contexts other than the US would qualify as a police state. Absolutely. Um, yeah, the uh, intelligence agency, the FBI, not formally known as police, but that's, that's their role, investigate and bring charges and clean up things which are impermissible activities in the United States. That's a police role. All right, and the police were essentially running the show in this regard. That's that's the nature of a police state, not held in check. Now I mentioned that COINTELPRO was a cryptonym during the period when it was officially operational, which as you pointed out was 56 to 71. 71 does not indicate that that's the end point. That's when they abandoned usage of the cryptonym, okay? The church committee, um, Senate committee that investigated all this in the mid 1970s indicated that they had discovered multiple operations that were ongoing that seemed to conform to the profile of COINTELPRO. So, you know, they changed the vernacular instead of being targeting extremists. Um, black nationalist hate groups. These are the various captions they put on the different programs that, that they had been running in the official period. They were talking about counterterrorism at the time and so forth. Counterterrorism has played much better than counterintelligence, you know, in terms of uh, public acceptance. Yeah, it kind of plays on the fear a little bit. Yeah, yeah. It was unknown until... Um, 1971, when some FBI agent uh, FBI documents were removed from uh, a resident agency in Media, Pennsylvania, and disclosed to the press, but also analyzed by the clandestine group that had removed them, and they came across the first indication of COINTELPRO, a document with that caption. Nobody knew what it meant, so you had uh, reporters who pursued it from there, and then the church committee really began to dig into it but they only dug into it so far right so <clears throat> excuse me the uh, church committee came out with extremely valuable information a ton of documents that had previously been confidential as the bureau called it which means nobody gets to see them outside of the bureau including bureaus technically part of the justice department and reports to the attorney general but this wasn't going to the attorney general either this all internal documents for the use of the fbi they brought a lot of that out and they disclosed a lot of things officially on record but it was also an exercise in containment because they talked about for example the fomenting of um uh, open hostility between what they considered to be violence prone groups. That was one of the techniques that was employed. Mm -hmm. Well, people got killed out of that and that's on record, but there's nothing in the church community to indicate that the FBI was directly culpable for that. It's the nature of the group. So they were buying the FBI men, uh, mythology in a way, and it was a covering action for the extent of well, the really egregious behavior that had comprised a lot of COINTELPRO. They focus more on non-lethal means and disruptive activities and... Um, Reading letters, that sort of thing. Yeah, rumor mongering and manipulation of the media and all the rest of that, all of which is true. Right. They just stop short. And I would say deliberately stop short because the information was right there in front of them, but they just weren't going to go there and say it. And it's worth noting, you know, they talked about this was systematically illegal. These are criminal activities in large part on the mm -hmm. part of bureau personnel and collaborating police agencies and so on, but no FBI 
agent or official has ever served a day, as far as I know, never served an hour of time in lockup as a result of any of it. You had three FBI officials, beginning with Deep Throat himself, um, Mark Felt, and Miller, who is the head of uh, Division Five operations in New York City, and another one, Bill Patrick Gray, who happened to be the FBI director who succeeded J. Edgar Hoover upon his death. Uh, they were all convicted of violation of citizens' rights for extreme burglaries on the families of Weatherman fugitives, which on a scale of things is a pretty low level offense. Mm -hmm. All right, but they were in fact convicted by a jury and Ronald Reagan, newly elected president at the time, intervened to pardon all three before they even had to, maybe they were mugshot, I don't know. Yeah. So there'd be fingerprints and mugshots someplace, but I'm sure each of them patriotically had submitted their own fingerprints to open FBI files on themselves, so nothing was gained there. And, uh, you know, L. Patrick Gray, his picture was all over the place, so photographing him didn't really accomplish anything. And the same with the other, well, probably Miller was less photographed than any of the rest, but there, <laughs> not a single soul did a moment of time. And Reagan said, you know, that was a torturous period in U.S. history and it was time to heal and move on past it. But he didn't say that with regard to any of the people who had been railroaded in prison on false charges as targets of COINTELPRO. They were all still serving their time and continued to serve their time because, of course, they were criminals. But I thought being convicted of that one kind of crime was the same as being convicted of another. Not so. That's the business of the lopsidedness, maintenance of status quo, if you will. It would be bad for morale of the uh, FBI if people were actually held to account, even in a symbolic way for low-level offenses. Kind of in and, the same way the police today aren't held to account for, you know, the uh -huh. similarly criminal activities. Yeah, like murder, for example. Yeah, um, uh -huh. it would be bad for morale for those other cops if somebody who murdered somebody, you know, a cop who murdered somebody was actually held to account for it. But what does morale mean in this context? You know, it would be the willingness to engage in the activity that somebody would be sanctioned for, somebody would be punished for. You've got to have the sense of impunity in order to act out the way it's intended to uh, repressive agencies act out. People got to know that they step out of line. Well, there's this range or continuum of possible consequences, none of which are pleasant, but also including, you know, getting shot 16 times as you're walking away from cops in night in Chicago, like Lacan McDonald. Well, that cop got convicted somewhat, you know, the, mm -hmm. sentence, the, the sentence does not really correspond to what it was he did, but at least he was sentenced. And now you've got Chauvin, Chauvin, however you pronounce it up in Minneapolis has been convicted waiting sentencing we'll see what the sentence actually is but you've got case after case after case where you've got evidence at least as clear as in either of the two cases i just you know recited and they've been given a pass they've either not been charged at all or mm -hmm. has been convinced to acquit in the face of evidence, which says, you know, people have been conditioned to a considerable extent to be accepting of this. Now you can shake that out along these famous racial lines and so forth, but more goes to political lines. And there's a preponderance of white folk to feel comfortable enough with status quo, um, business as usual, whatever you want to call it.
Mm -hmm. They understand that the cops make the unacceptable, force those in the position of being accorded unacceptable position in society and unacceptable treatment in society to accept it. At least to the extent they understand that if they stand up for their rights, if they oppose it, that they can suffer even greater, more greatly unacceptable outcomes. Well, and you mentioned this this con this concept of, of of conditioning leading to the acceptance of things that are obviously unethical, and sure. I want I wonder what mechanisms you see as as um, enabling that conditioning process. Well, you got what uh, you mentioned Noam Chomsky a little bit ago. What he and Ed Herman talked about the doctrinal system. Mm -hmm. and Obviously, the media plays a large part in this, but the media is what's being conveyed in the media is reinforced through the education system, so called. All right. right, including higher education, maybe particularly higher education. All right, but also popular entertainment. How many cop shows do you figure air as opposed to radical shows that might be a well, None. talk about radical shows <laughs> good luck yeah you got a zero on one side and then however many cop shows air in a given week um yeah there are things genre of war films as well you know yeah yeah i mean it's pretty much a seamless system and it's all reinforcing of this thing that you know, while it's not perfect, this is the best of all possible societies. And if you don't believe that, well, you should lose, lose uh, excuse me, at least lose your job as a starting quarterback in the uh, NFL. All right. But more likely end up doing decades in prison if you're effective at communicating that. Or in particular cases, you could try Martin Luther King, for example. Mm -hmm. you know, you'd simply end up dead. Yeah. Yeah. You can be falsely convicted. And, you know, we got numerous cases of Geronimo Pratt, Druba Ben Wahad, and on and on of members, key members of the Black Panther Party who were convicted of things wrongly, falsely, uh, illegally exculpatory evidence with old manufactured and perjured evidence presented against them and so on and so on. Um, Daruba did 19 years in New York. <clears throat> His, the verdict against him was ultimately vacated after best part of 20 years incarceration for something that uh, was bogus. You know, it was a frame. And Geronimo Pratt, even more egregiously, you did 27 years, eight and a half of it in solitary lockdown for a murder that was committed in Santa Monica, California at a time when he was attending a central committee meeting of the Black Panther Party in the Bay Area. Right. Now, that's 350 miles difference. Yeah, pretty good alibi, I'd say. Yeah, it was. And they were asking how I could prove that. Now, I mean, there, there's a lot of complications because the FBI had fomented a split or exacerbated a, a split, maybe is a better way to put it, in Black Panther Party. So the people who had been at that meeting, with one exception, were unprepared to testify in his behalf. Okay, he was frozen out, excommunicated from Black Panther Party at the time he went to trial, but he said, he could prove his whereabouts at the time on the basis of the FBI's electronic surveillance of the Black Panther Party headquarters in the very, he'd stayed across the bay in San Francisco. The, the meeting was in Oakland. He was across the bay at a, a residence that he also knew was being surveilled, both by bugs and by wiretaps. And the FBI responded to that by saying they had no such surveillance. 
And then it came out that they did, and the judge ordered the release of the uh, June logs, as they were called. That was the FBI file caption for electronic surveillance of transcripts and, and such. And they came in, the FBI was all embarrassed, and they I mean, so well, in fact, you know, the surveillance was done, and the transcripts do exist. We just happen to be missing the records, the uh, June logs, on a two-week period, which just happened to be the two weeks in which the Central Committee meeting occurred. Now, of course, that gets accepted, right? Like those sort of ideas and excuses don't get yeah. really investigated. In any any run-of-the-mill case, that'd be sufficient to at least vacate the verdict, send it back to trial. Not in that case. They just left him in prison. And that was the California court system because murder is a, a local offense. All right, this is how it worked. And it was not time to heal from the wounds of that traumatic period by virtue of pardoning the people who have been railroaded into prison under circumstances like these. And you got some that are still in prison. You know, a guy died within the last month, Chip Fitzgerald, who had been in prison since 1967. Uh, I don't know even what to say about that other than in California is a state where uh, people convicted of really grotesque murders that are not political in nature, or the people are not considered political. Uh, the average time served is historically less than 10 years. Now, you can count the years as well as I can since 1967. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we've got an 85 year old Sundiata Akali in uh, New Jersey at this point that he reached parole date and a court ordered him released on the basis of uh, his record in prison in some amount of time served and all the rest of that several years ago and that was appealed by the state and he's still in, still in prison still in prison this is not normal behavior and this is in a country which uh, political prisoners are generated on a regular basis and held circumstances like this in the face of denial from academia, from the media, from officialdom, from entertainment, and so on, and so on, and so on, that there are political prisoners in the United States. That's something that happens in those. Well, it's not something that's widely known, right? Like, it's like, it's not, it's not something that people think about when they think about the United States. They think about gulags and stuff. Well, what would you call the most important incarcerated population in the world, you know, a gulag. And it's yeah. not the labor free environments, you know, but people are paid for their labor here. Yeah. Yeah. You work an eight hour day and they put a, about $3 in an account and charge you five for a 15 minute phone call out because you can only use their phone system and so on and so on. Labor is being done, mm -hmm. you know, that's the old saw you hear, you know, 50 years at hard labor. Okay. Not so much hard labor in terms of breaking rocks or working on plantations or so forth in the federal system, but check out the state systems. And that's where the bulk of prisoners end up being launched. Because as I indicated um, in conversation with you a little earlier on, mm -hmm. you know, when the FBI ran COINTELPRO, it was not a solo act. It was not just FBI personnel that were implementing this. They had collaborative relationships with the red squads and police departments of every city large enough to have one in the country. And they had good relations in the places that were too small. So they could sort of put together, cobble together a police collaborative enterprise to take out a targeted activist. Even if you're in, oh, I don't know, Canton, Illinois, or Canton, Ohio, neither of which is exactly a major metropolitan area, but it could be done, you know? Well, and it also seems to me that it, there's, 
you know, in the same way that like the media is just decentralized enough in name that people don't think of it as necessarily a propaganda system when that's how it functions, you know, like the police forces are equally separated enough in name that you don't think of it like a police state when that's what it is in reality. Yeah. Well, you know, all my adult life I've been hearing from the critical side of things, and this is not necessarily radical, just usually from uh, liberals, people who are invested in the system, mm -hmm. not trying to radically transform it or replace it. They're trying to perfect it, but you know, they set up a, a list of criteria that are indicated by things they, they know the police are doing in any given moment, whether that be the late, late 60s or the mid 70s or into the 80s, you keep going. Mm -hmm. Okay. And give them a moment. They've got a list of things that things keep going this way. If these things are being done and they become accepted, we're going to end up in a police state. Well, they did all that stuff from the late sixties and they did all that stuff from the seventies and they were doing it all over again in the eighties with the CISPES investigation and all that. And the consolidation of SWAT teams in the um, 1033 program transferring military ordinance to police forces all over the country. I mean, every police force in a country just about has received military grade equipment, weaponry and so forth, even bayonets and uh, trenching tools. And I don't know what they're doing with some of these things, digging foxholes, whatever. All right. Each of these things is increased increased increase these trajectories the uh, uh monitoring invasions of privacy the capacity technological uh capacity you know it's been actualized well we're going to end up in a police state if this keeps going it's kept going the whole time and the rate at, that it is going now we can't even get a handle on because of the secret technological dimensions of it that half of us don't even understand even when we try when our attention focuses on it, at what point you have to ask yourself, was it no longer a case of we're going to end up in, but mm -hmm. we did end up in, and basically nobody noticed. In the well, same way that like Donald Trump, you know, everyone's like, oh my God, it's a fascist president. And it's like, well, I mean, that, that's been happening. You know, that's not new. Yeah. I mean, they can take it back. I can take it back a long way if you want to, but uh, yeah, well, the, the late period of the Vietnam War and the Pentagon Papers coming out, okay? And that demonstrated the government had systematically misrepresented reality to the citizenry here, okay? It's for the incremental engagement of the United States and what became a war. Well, they got a lot of names on a wall in Washington, DC, but 4 million Indo-Chinese died as a result of that. Nobody even paid attention to the collateral operation that was going on in Indonesia, killed a million and a half Indonesians. I mean, you've got Hitlerian scale violence occurring mm -hmm. to destroy politically objectionable regimes or pre prevent them from coming into being that were popularly embraced by their citizenry that was going on. The U.S. had been lying to its own population systematically through the whole process that begins really in the late 1940s, but pick it up with the Geneva Accords in 1954, right up to the present moment when the uh, Papers were leaked, as they say, released, basically, right. uh, without permission, whistleblowing, if you right. will, grand scale. Right. I mean, it's just like the okay. WMD thing in Iraq, right? The government misleads the public about the threat of an, a country that's basically sure. just not doing what they want them to do. Sure. Yeah. Uranium being brought in from Niger and special tubing and all of that, which ended up to be entirely false. And I got, I got to take a momentary break here. Yeah, of course. Okay. 
All right, we are back. Um, <clears throat> let's dive a little bit back more into Co uh, into CoIntel Pro, and then maybe talk a little bit about the role of academia in maintaining status quo figure configurations of power. If that's all right with you. Fine. Great. Um, so I was I was very curious to know what the reactions to your book were when you published it. Um, you know, obviously it wasn't going to be on the front page of the New York Times book review by virtue of its content. Um, so I do wonder, like, what was the academic response, the popular response? How was it received? I, well, it was it was received OK. Um, that would be my general impression. It was received enthusiastic among uh, people who have been organized, like the Black Panther Party, that have been targeted. Um, actually, it's referred to as the book uh, at this point. It's obviously outdated, but it's getting reprinted again in those circles, probably in the fall. So there. That ranges from enthusiasm, some younger folks who are all enthusiastic about it, but didn't seem to uh, be able to <laughs> absorb what was being said in, it, in a lot of cases, because mm -hmm. they went around and did what it was, or pointing out that had made Quintel Pro effective. They didn't quite get it, you know, stop backbiting each other, for example, because you're creating a perfect environment for the operatives to come in and foment uh, disruptive circumstances mm -hmm. you know, and leads to all kinds of ugly stuff. In academia, it had a lot of footnotes, but then you had people who were already had established themselves in that sort of containment enterprise. Ethan Theo Harris, for example, who had worked on staff for the church committee, came out with pretty much, as far as I know, the, the first book other than the committee report itself, analyzing spying on Americans. And uh, had quite a lot about COINTELPRO in it. Interestingly enough, he focused most of his COINTELPRO analysis on FBI operations against the Klan. Right. Representing quite a lot. I mean, everything he pointed out having happened in the operations against the Klan had happened. Mm -hmm. So it, it's accurate, it's useful in terms of information in that regard, but it's a wildly skewed uh, kind of presentation. Uh, Theo Harris went into the uh, Nation magazine, Liberal Left, and denounced the whole enterprise that Van der Waal and I had come up with, uh, first with regard to the American Indian movement, there was no possibility in his mind that uh, that could qualify as COINTELPRO, even though the church committee had essentially determined that it was and was prepared to uh, pursue hearings on the matter right up to the moment in uh, June of 1975 when uh, you had the two agents killed in the firefight at Oglala, with leads to the Pel uh, Peltier case. So they postponed that set of hearings, you know, because the, you know, the situation with the FBI and they just lost two agents and, you know, this would, so we'll hold off a while until the emotions are simmered down. I'm still waiting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we had run that out. He, he basically trashed the first of the two books that we came out with on this stuff, COINTELPRO papers was the second, and that was uh, documents and so forth, information that we collected in the process of putting the first one together that did not fit within it. So we uh, devoted the second one to that, and his critique of uh, COINTELPRO papers it was a work of synthesis rather than original archival research. Uh, I don't know what to say to that, because I'm pretty sure that uh, those masses of documents that we were going through on disclosure with regard to the Leonard Peltier case, for example, would constitute essentially archival research, right? Yeah, just because it's not technically in an archive doesn't mean it's not archival, right? <clears throat> well, it's not an official archive. Yeah. Or an institutional archive, 
and so forth. But it, you know, when you're looking at 170,000 pages of paper, as was Kate, you know, with one of these, that's an archive of some sort. If you went to Stanford or Emory or someplace to look the Panther archive and you were looking for a particular thing, you would probably be looking at a collection of paper exactly like this. This just happens to be in boxes that are in possession of a defense attorney. So um, it was a nonsensical argument. So that's part of the response in academia. Mm -hmm. was really trying to reinforce the official conclusions that had come out of the church committee in a way, even when they sort of skated the inconvenient aspects of that. Like I say, church committee was not of the view that the FBI would not and could not um, by 1973, four or five, in that frame have been engaged in the kinds of operations that, you know, we described and documented. Um, so that's a piece of it. Media basically didn't have anything to say about it at all, you know. Both those books were reviewed, I suppose you could say alternative media, mm -hmm. quite favorably. But in terms of mainstream media, as you said, it's not going to make the New York Review of Books. It's not going to make uh, New York Times Book Review. It's not going to make any of those things. Didn't really expect that it would. And <laughs> their performance met expectations. Now, a bit of that, perhaps, although we didn't really push it that far, was, you know, the role of the media in uh, effectuating COINTELPRO. In Directly, right? Like through the I actually like collaboration between media outlets and employees and the FBI. Yeah, they, Jagger Hoover or the uh, Public Records Division of the FBI, as it was called, which would have been uh, names escaping me at, at a moment, but you you had a guy who was just basically a spin artist who went to work in the 1930s to build the FBI's image and build Hoover's personal image. He ran that so-called crime records for 20 some years. It was a very sophisticated operation. They had a stable of what they called uh, friendly or uh, cooperating journalists. Mm -hmm. That was print media initially, um, primarily magazines and newspapers, both. But came to include, uh, well, I had a radio guy uh, right along, Walter Winchell, but he was not the only one. And electronic media became increasingly important. And they had people that would fulfill that as well. They wrote things in along an ideological line with a slant they knew would be approved by the bureau, which meant the director in the end, and he'd send them little notes, and then they had access. Okay, they get the scoops, but the scoops always corresponded to how the FBI wanted to shape things. And, you know, in the most extreme cases, there was a, a they had professional writers in there. I mean, Hoover never wrote a book, you'll see, Masters of Deceit and Study of Communism and all the rest of those titles with his byline, you know, Jagger Hoover as author, but they were written by agents assigned to that in both uh, the records division and sometimes by Sullivan's people and the communist stuff. They were written collectively by agents and Put out under his name. Yeah, what you're describing to me with regards especially to like getting the inside scoop and that relationship that develops between intelligence agencies and the media sits with exactly what Herman and Chomsky talk about in the propaganda model and in, in manufacturing. Well, what it didn't, what it didn't take it was that the FBI was actually writing up stories and a lot of these guys, Ron Cosell in Chicago, for example, probably Ed Montgomery, uh, 
San Francisco. These are name reporters. Mm -hmm. And the propaganda specialists in crime records and elsewhere in the Bureau were writing the stories and they were signing off. They were literally written by the FBI, but afraid parents that, you know, Take someone else's name on it, make it look legitimate. Well, somebody with a, a, a name as a reporter, too. Mm -hmm. so you had 450 odd friendly and cooperating journalists doing this kind of stuff during wow. the 1960s. Yeah. That's crazy. And that's not counting the talking heads on news. Well, you're creating a sort of a critical mass of information there that the lesser reporters and the cub reporters and so forth will just go along with. And a whole lot of what gets reported in the smaller city newspapers and so forth, are, if they're not coming off the FBI, you know, they're looking at the uh, reportage in the New York Times or wherever, and they're, they're basically sitting there and rewriting that. So you're getting variations on a theme that lead all of them lead to that same conclusion. So, you know, you had the situation where by 1970, you had somewhere in the vicinity of 30 Panthers who have been killed by police. And you may have 10% of that, three cops that were dead of Panther action by that point. And yet, if you go back and look at the newspaper descriptions, mm -hmm. okay, violence prone Panthers seems to be what they named themselves. You couldn't say Panther or Black Panther Party without violence prone as a predicate, okay? Over and over and over. Anybody that's reading the daily paper is going to hear about the violence prone Panthers. Nobody's talking about the violence prone police. All right. Yeah, I mean, I. It's, sort of, it's that sort of thing, which then leads to a sort of a, a public, if not acquiescence, then active embrace of what's being done over a period of time. And it's only now, really, that it's become something of a cottage industry to lay out what was actually being done by by whom to whom at the time. So you've got a lot of Panther men warrants and stuff that are being published, usually by alternative presses. There's mm -hmm. a couple of instances, Elaine Brown's memoir, and I think uh, David Hilliard's as well, are published by mainstream publishers, so-called. Although I don't even know what that means anymore because the publisher like publishing companies basically right yeah but they're all owned by some overarching corporation you know mm -hmm. so I, I don't know who's really doing this but in any case mostly coming out of a, a smaller or alternative presses usually dissident stuff um, dissident presses publishing dissident stuff so it's harder to gauge at this point with the uh, technological um, modifications or developments that have occurred, it, you can do small scale publishing much easier and much more cheaply than was the case in some times past. Now, the question becomes how many people actually end up reading these things, you know? Right, they kind of appeal to a specific demographic and swim around right. circles without entering the mainstream. Yeah, so, you know, you get the list of books that the New York Times is recommending in its uh, Sunday review section for your take up your summer and it's vacuous. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I remember looking at one of the big fives publishers, um, you know, like featured books of the year, you know, and it was a, it was a Michelle Obama documentary or a autobiography, a, yeah. um, Jordan Peterson book, like just like these, like very, like to call Jordan Peterson, even neoliberal, I think is not even fair. Like he's, he's that bad, but, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I, this totally sits with what 
um, my understanding of the publishing industry looks like and the media distribution system more broadly, you know? Mm -hmm. And there it is. So where COINTELPRO went was it sort of got institutionalized, legitimated through executive orders and the uh, Counterterrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act under Clinton and, you know, step by step by step. While the technological capacity to engage in a lot of these activities has eliminated some of the cruder aspects of COINTELPRO, COINTELPRO is ubiquitous at this point. You know, you can ask random people in a mosque around the country because they've got their profiles, you know. And there you have it. Now, COINTELPRO is our day-to-day -day reality, but we call it something else. And we're all worried about uh, corporates ha corporations hawking uh, their wares as an invasion of privacy, and et cetera, you know. The FBI files that uh, I was examining under Freedom of Information Act when investigating the official COINTELPRO here are nothing compared to the, the files that even young activists basically in their networking and so forth are compiling on themselves. The degree of detail and so forth that you'll almost never find in a, a 1950s or 60s or 70s period uh, FBI file. So monitoring allows them to do in terms of political repression, what it is the military has been able to do with a related stream of technology, these surgical strikes, sometimes they hit the wrong target, a wedding party and so forth, but drone strikes and missile strikes and so forth. So the US is not incurring casualties, but they're more or less surgically without having to do all the crude stuff that involves introducing maneuver battalions and tanks, military operations to not scale, which, you know, they wreck the joint. Just the tanks driving over fields and stuff just lays waste to things. They can do it much more uh, efficiently now. And without upsetting the population as much, because an invasion has this quality of wartime that we figure we're not in war. Well, we're always, we're like the Roman Empire in that sense, like always at war, you know, to some degree. Well, yeah. And I, you know, I did a book, uh, came out in 2003, I believe, called On Justice for Roosting Chickens, that uh, has a chronology. It's in three parts. And one part is a chronology called that most peace loving of nations, which is a US self descriptor uttered by a, yeah, several presidents, presidents, you know, and I take it from 1776, I believe I'd have to look mm -hmm. like one of several years, you could consider the incept date of the United States. And it ran up to current at the time. And there was not a single year in that entire period when the United States was actually at peace. They just were not counting things like uh, the so-called Indian Wars, which were actually the settlers' wars. They were not counting things like the military operations in uh, Latin America for in fact regime change and such as that, or in the Caribbean or, you know, you can keep it going. There, there is not a point. And while we're at it, putting down slave revolts and such as that. So usually what you've got in a year which the United States was supposedly at peace are several wars that are being waged. Not even low intensity. It just didn't require a whole lot of... Uh, military weight to be swung in order to accomplish their objectives. You know, whether it's going after a small group of Indians, it would be a, a people, actually. But you're talking a few hundred 
usually by the time the military gets involved, not always, but usually, and they've been reduced by disease and so forth over some preceding period of time. And now the military comes in and does what it's going to do. Well, that's a war. It's actually been a war. You know, you don't have to be firing guns at people in order for it to be a war. You can engage in other activities. As, as the United States points out with regard to actions that are taken against it, it's fully aware of that. The population usually momentarily aware of it, at least when that comes out on television. Oh yeah, that's hostile action by a foreign yeah, power. Some trade agreement, some, some, you know, embargo, whatever it is, can all be, mm -hmm. I mean, you can kill hundreds of thousands of people without, as you say, firing a shot. And, um, you know, like by the logic of, you know, dominant American ideological constructs, like you'd think that we haven't been at war with Cuba since, you know, the fifties, but that's been happening every single day since mm -hmm. since Castro took over, you know? At, in various ways. I mean, the embargo, yeah, that's a continuous tone. But in the midst of that, there were how many different attempts to uh, assassinate Fidel Castro and other people, you know, of significance in the regime that everybody focuses on the attempts to make Castro disappear by way of death or his beard to fall out to be embarrassed or, or whatever. <laughs> These are acts of war. You're going after a head of state. It's also illegal to target a, a head of state under uh, international law. But then again, international laws for other people, the United States is uh, exceptional. Yeah, American he uses a phrase I really like where he says basically that like the U.S. uses in the same way that you were talking about the U.S. being a peaceable, loving nation. I forget the phrase exactly that that the phrase the peace process is used constantly. But what it really means is just whatever the U.S. happens to be doing at the time. Yeah, yeah. well, I've got another chronology, but it only begins with the Second World War. It's in Justice of Brewster and Chickens. OK. Mm -hmm. And it's called the Nation of Laws, which is, you know, John Marshall saying from 1803. This is actually, it's always quoted as being a nation of laws. What he actually said was this is a government of laws, not of men. But okay, it's been repeated as part of Americana that it's a nation of laws. So I put that up and then just ran down from 1945 to what was current then, 2003. Mm -hmm. as violations or refusals from the international law which is it much longer than the uh, than the other one it's just continuous well and i think that you make a really important point it, which like it rejects and simply goes its own way which include customary law is exactly what it was the germans were accused of having done in the 1930s and of course in the 1940s but that's a different somewhat different context mm -hmm. in fact the hitlerian diplomacy around munich which is so reviled is a direct lift from george washington before he was even president saying you enter into treaties with no intent to comply, but you gain advantage, both in terms of lulling the Indians, you know, into a false sense of security, and usually uh, gain strategic position on them through land sessions and such, so that you have them, them now in an indefensible position, and you can gobble up their whole territory. Well, that's exactly what Hitler did at Munich. Yeah, the parallels are, are, are constant and, and not coincidental either. I mean, I think that <clears throat> Hitler drew a lot from the U.S. empire. He did. Yes, you, he know? Did. you know, he got in Mein Kampf rejecting all the uh, European empires. All right. And basically, he's pointing to paraphrase or adopt Hitlerian language, the Nordics of North America, you know, provide the model. Of course, they were going. That's Liebensraum, right? Like that, that was kind of the idea. Politics is how he framed the politic of living space. Yeah. And 
you know, he said the Volga will be our Mississippi. That's pretty clear. Yeah, yeah, very clear. On the U.S., those Nordics in North America moved largely, not entirely. They were coming from all directions, really. But uh, the main shove was from east to west. And his reversed that. He was going from west to east. And he was going to establish this continental block that would make Germany, Gross Deutschland, Greater Germany, and its contiguous colonies in East, Eastern Europe, the European portion of Russia, and Belarus and Ukraine, make it a, a block that uh, around which good portion of the world revolved so that you were establishing this multipolar yeah uh, sort of world order in which germany would be a major player a key player he wanted to be the top dog player obviously but mm -hmm. he also had longevity problems you know how long are you going to be alive man so what will happen in the future? Well, he, he's establishing the basis for it. That was that was what he had in mind. So you can consolidate the conquest, given if you could have oil uh, within his lifetime. I also believe that to be true. It's kind of a manifest destiny, you know. Just exactly so. Yeah. Exactly so, and uh, a racial supremacy of a sort that uh, really marks. U.S. conception of self, yeah. traditionally. But what you're saying is you're talking the American conception of self or the U.S. conception of self, you're talking about a preferred block of white people. And not all white people were the same either, you know. <laughs> no, like Nash wrote an interesting book called How the Irish Became White. Mm -hmm. And the Italians, I imagine, to some degree. Exactly. And further south in Italy, the more scant they wanted to look at you. And East Europeans were kind of, you know, there's a lot of Jewish folk among them. And you know, you know how to do that. Right. I mean, the resonances between the the attitude, the outlook, the mindset, if you will, here and Nazi Germany, they're clear. And I think it manifests so much in the culture in ways that are constantly invisibilized and just taken for granted, you know, like as someone who grew up in the suburbs and, you know, went to a, had a very conventional U.S. history education, mm -hmm. being exposed to ideas outside the spectrum of normal opinion is so jaw dropping because it's just like it's just outside of my reality you know in ways that are that is pure conditioning in the way that you have described earlier it's powerful yeah when you get these lessons your compulsory education up to well in my day it was 16 years old at what point can you drop out of school today i would imagine still 16 but i, I don't know 16 yeah yeah and what you're getting in school is being reinforced with if you're from the suburb church groups neighborhood groups boy scouts all of that sports teams um and coaches are not exactly what you call overflowing vessels of liberalism much less progressivism or That's very authoritarian in nature right uh the news that you would read the entertainment you watch whether you're going to the uh, movies or you're watching tv or you're playing some video game i mean video games my god you know yeah I'm you're like killing some guy who has like kind of a russian accent it's not he's not necessarily identified as russian but basically yeah. definitely is you know and it's all just like establishing this sort of like mythological battle between the U.S. and its perceived enemies, and it's very um, propagandistic in nature and unacknowledged. I think. Oh. Yeah, we don't have to acknowledge. You know, the, the sky is blue. Do you? 
you have to go out of your way to point that out? I mean, these things are presented self-evident truths. And one of my things is always, you know, education is to teach people how to think, right? And that requires critical engagement with the world around you, the relations with people, community to community, and all of that in terms of social structure, but quite generally, it's posing questions and pursuing answers critical inquiry. If you think about how you went through a public education in the United States, and for that matter, undergraduate education, mm -hmm. at college level, you're continuously being presented in class with the answers to questions you have not yet formulated, never occurred to you. Wow. Now, putting something up and saying, well, interrogate this. Let's talk about this. What are you making of this? No, they're giving you the answer in a sound bite. And you progress to the next phase of that by being able to regurgitate those answers in the form of tests. Okay. Absorb it. Move on to the next block. Get it in a more advanced and elaborated form. Absorb it. Move on to the next block. To the point where you get to you know, and there's a few people in the undergraduate thing which leak out honor students and so forth. They're being groomed for something else, but they're getting into some critical inquiry sometimes, but often the nature of the critical inquiry, part of the uh, instruction, if you will, is how do you take these problematic issues that you're interested in and package them in such a way as to be considered exemplary by your profession or panel of professors. And that's prep for graduate school, where whatever your outlook may be, you're going to have to go up against a committee that uh, are probably kind of of the establishmentarian orientation. You know, you think about what uh, this inclusive thing, bringing a black professor into being, bringing in an indigenous professor into being and so forth. Okay, all of a sudden it became absolutely essential that you have a PhD. It hadn't been. Right. Okay. I'll just start with Derek Bell and use him as an example. He didn't have a PhD when they hired him as a senior uh, political analyst at Columbia. In fact, he had already published a book called The End of Ideology, for which they violated their own rules and awarded him a PhD, okay, in order that they could make it appear that everybody's being held to the same standard. All kinds of people came in with uh, equivalencies to teach in academia until you start getting people of color in. Then they had to have a PhD. And a PhD, if you've been through that process, is taking a battery of instruction, you take some courses, mm -hmm. and then you write a dissertation, a book length treatment of a subject of which you have to convince people. In the case of the scholars of color, the very people that they were critiquing convince them that their scholarship is sound. It's got to be acceptable to those that you're in opposition to. Where does that leave you? On a good day, it leaves you with a, a assistant professorship, which means you've got a signed block of time to publish in the journals that are run by these same people, for the most part, because the journals are ranked. The more establishment they are, the higher the ranking, and so on. Okay, in order to be awarded tenure so that you know you'll continue to have a job. All right. Assuming you spend your six years and are successful in acquiring tenure and you're jumping through hoops that whole whole time. Okay. You've got your tenure. Now you've got an undefined period of time in order to be deserving of promotion to full professor where you might actually 
make a living wage that can pay off your education loan. So by the time you get there, you're usually so battered and exhausted that you're never going to say what it was that motivated you to go into this enterprise in the first place. Now, you obviously have exceptions to that, but it's a normative sort of thing. It's Yeah, it filters people out. It's filtering mechanisms. Uh-huh. Uh, and they learn that you get rewarded for towing the line of the status quo and reinforcing it in whatever lame form you may be doing that. You may not even believe it, but you know that's where the reward is. And if you make waves, well, you don't get promoted as fast or you don't get promoted as all, or you get targeted and you get eliminated, budget exigency or whatever. So, and the whole one part, at least, of your uh, performance package is based on peddling this view of things to younger students as they're coming up. So you can see the nature of the process here. This is not a pursuit of truth for its own sake. This is a reinforcement of established or sanctioned truth, in quotes. Capital T, yeah. Uh... Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's like this whole dense network of interrelating institutions that all kind of like the acad the academy in many ways supports the state, the state in many ways supports the academy, the private sector draws from the academy, also funds the academy, you know, it's all this interlocking that I feel is, as you say, just like filtering people out and, and, and con making them conform over, yeah. Yeah, overall. Yeah, if, you know, people think they have the answers to questions that have never been asked and their, their well-being, their material well-being, their psych and social well-being and all the rest of it contingent upon these things being true. They'll defend them to death even if they don't know. Well, I don't know about to death, but yeah, uh, they don't tend to die falling their sword for these things, but they do in, tend to uphold it. Okay. And a lot of them believe him very sincerely, which is the kind of part of the that's, scariest. That's true. A whole lot of Germans believe very sincerely in what it was that was being peddled at Nuremberg, too. So, you know, the fact that they uh, are sincere in their beliefs doesn't carry much water, as far as I'm concerned. It's what those beliefs tend to be. And if you're believing the sorts of things we're talking about, then who are you? What are you? What's the implication of that and i've got to take another break all right <laughs> um so i guess my last question is you know obviously there are all these systemic structural problems that affect academia and prevent it from being able to do what i think it's supposed to do which is pursue truth and try to change the world in positive ways um and so i guess like i would ask what like, how do you feel these sort of things can be changed or addressed and what positive steps do you think can be taken in academia to deconstruct the relationship between power and knowledge? Oh, well, the first aspect of that is for the individuals who are employed in it, not to allow themselves to be defined by it. If you're defining who you are by virtue of the fact that you hold an institutional rank, okay, or a particular job, you're beat before you start. So it's, it's a matter of personal interrogation as to who you are, what your values are and so forth, and present yourself in such a way as you remain consistent with them. In an old guy, Creek uh, spiritual leader by name Philip Deer once put it to me, you know, you speak the truth as you understand it. Don't ever say anything else. Okay. And never back away from it. Never back up. Never compromise it. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's something you find is a bit of a rarity in academia. Everybody talks about academic freedom, et cetera, et cetera. 
but you can wash them all bending things to avoid taking heat. So just, just so. Acknowledge that you go up against an institution, you confront the institution that has ramifications and effects. You probably won't win under present circumstances, but that simply reinforces the integrity of who you are. Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. So getting a, a, a mass of people who don't see an institutional birth as a be all end all, you know, is key to organizing anything that can actually have an effect on the institutional structure. But the university system is an integral part of the power structure in the United States. So anything that brings pressure to bear and disrupting uh, business as usual and compelling change has collateral effect on the ability of the university, academia, whatever you want to call it, to maintain its operational efficiency, opens cracks, you need to exploit those, but mainly just remain consistent with, I don't believe in what it is they're doing, which is using the institutions for the pretty much exact opposite of what you just described as being the institutional role, mm -hmm. ideally. You know, and force force that change. It's yeah. You know, the no, best. No, that's like. Sorry, you go. It, it, you know, it, this is why I call it struggle. There's not an easy answer. No pills you can take, or a particular script you can follow. And the actors change, the circumstances change. You just got to be constantly engaged. And my objective is always to speak the truth as I know it. And if I'm not doing it in this classroom, which is very convenient, you know, it's, it's very convenient to have the classroom, the students assembled there and getting a paycheck for it all at the same time. I wouldn't deny that. I did it for a long time. Mm -hmm. okay. But if you get forced out of that classroom, out of that particular situation, there's still people to talk to out there. There's people, actually, some of them want information in more concrete ways than the students that you're talking to in the classroom. You remain who you are if you're consistent with yourself and continue to do the work. You bring pr pressure to bear externally rather than internally, but both are necessary. And it's a protracted struggle, we've discovered. There was a time in my youth when I thought the revolution was going to happen in about 15 minutes. Yeah. You know, it didn't. But I'm still at it to a considerable extent, I would say. Not in the same ways. Couldn't in the same ways. I'm not 20, 25 years old anymore. Yeah. There are people who are. And older, younger, and all the rest of that, all needed, all needed. Yeah, and I think it's, uh, what I really like what you said about, like, kind of finding the fissures in the, in the, in the systemic structure and trying to exploit them. You know, there's a, a quote I heard about about the media, for instance, is that like, if you're an insider who really wants to change it, you have to kind of play it like a violin and that that can be difficult to do, you know? Yeah, it's 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 interesting, you know, I, I said I was in the institutional context for quite a while, you know, as you pointed out, I was faculty for 17 years, but I did uh, program development stuff for a while before that. So mm -hmm. I got a good look at the mechanics of, well, a given institution, but they're not really all that dissimilar one to the yeah. next. And uh, you can play it. I played it for a long time. Yeah. Got some things done. 
since I left, they've undone a lot of them, but they were done for a while. And I still hear from students and I still hear from colleagues and so forth that are still doing the work. So yeah, mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, yeah. I feel, yeah, I feel, I'm just really glad that I contacted you and, and glad that we were able to talk. I've, I'm really excited to, to rewatch this. Well, hopefully it's useful to you. I'd like to see the article you sent the uh, sort of teaser on. Mm -hmm. you hold it, if you could send it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, where are you?